conclude my remarks with that and introduce uh, the first speaker, John Harley Warner, uh, in a very direct sense, is uh, responsible for all of you being here today. Um, my senior year of college, I took a medical history course uh, from him. Uh, and it was the term paper that I wrote for that class that sort of launched what's proved to be a, a lifelong fascination and uh, interest in this disease and some of its associated problems. So I'm very honored and happy to present uh, Professor John Harley Warner, who's the chair of the History of Medicine Department at Yale University. So I'm going to start by very gingerly uh, rearranging the audiovisual. Um, I also say um, I want to show for the end a five-minute film clip from a um, 1924 public health film on tuberculosis. So if you can't really see this, there are some seats closer. Um, I'm terrible about moving seating at dinner parties and clothing. <laughs> I also feel absolutely at home here with the uh, projector perched on the waste paper basket. Uh, in the classroom where I'm teaching uh, this term at Yale, my podium is a waste paper basket. So the only difference is that here you don't have to worry, I don't think, about pieces of the ceiling falling on you. Okay. It is not my aim uh, this morning to focus explicitly on Hansen's disease, as other speakers will do. Instead, I want to sketch in really quite broad strokes an historical background that help us, might help us see the more blatant but also more subtle ways in which contagion, the idea of contagion, fear of contagion, the social practices that inform both, has forged links between disease and stigma in Western societies. I will briefly trace some of the changing, yet oftentimes remarkably durable, moral meanings attached to microbial infection and microbial avoidance. More than this, I want to examine the ways that cultural expectations about purity and danger uh, mapped onto not only infected individuals, but marginal groups marked as different, threatening, perhaps dangerous, have informed stigmatization. Um, now, I wasn't sure before coming about the background, uh, your, your uh, collective background. Um, I think what I can say is every single one of you will find some of the territory I'm exploring familiar, but I hope you can try to see it through new eyes as we start the day's uh, broader exploration of disease and stigma. My aim is to prompt prompt thinking about some important issues uh, without pretending to give any simple answers or simplistic lessons. I'm going to focus on just two nodal points in the cultural meanings that have been attached to contagion in Western societies. First, I want to take us to um, a quite distant past, to a particular moment in the history of disease that was also a defining moment in Western uh, culture's uh, imagery and expectation about contagion, infection, and culpability for disease, particularly in times of plague. Then I want to turn to a more recent past, but still for us distant, the early decades of the 20th century, just after the bacteriological revolution, when, which was a formative moment, not, not just by infusing germ theory into professional and lay consciousness, but also by setting in place what are now deeply rooted ways of thinking about microbes, imagining microbial threats, and of assigning meaning to people with infectious diseases or feared to be their carriers. Now, from my perspective as an historian, um, one of the most remarkable things about the past two decades, not just in professional, but more especially in popular culture, is the preoccupation with the unknown threats of new pathogens, new diseases, fear of contagion that is most frenzied and virulent uh, when uncertainty about the nature of danger is the greatest. And Paul 
has already alluded to uh, some of the, uh, the clear uh, rosters here. This is a new sense of danger and fragility, uh, real, but all often, as you well know, sensationalized in the popular media in works like this. Uh, Laurie Garrett's best-selling book, The Coming Plague, reflected a preoccupation of our culture. Um, the documentary that was based on the book, which first aired in 1987, warned in the words of one ad about the devastating worldwide reemergence of diseases we thought we had conquered. Ebola virus, uh, identified in 1978, gained public attention through the 1995 outbreak in Zaire, but also from work such as uh, The Hot Zone. Um, and I just note that the imagery that has come with news coverage in this country, uh, this is from, no, 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 this isn't. This is from the uh, inside cover of The Hot Zone. Um, the news coverage often lingers on the notion of Africa as the dangerous hot zone threatening the rest of the world, uh, so that public discourse on the coming plague often is distinctly racialized, playing on notions of the dangerous other. And this, which now is the right slide, um, this is from one of the worst films of recent summers. Um, a good gauge on popular culture, though, that led a New York Times reviewer to conclude that the film makes it official. In his words, microbial plagues have displaced nuclear winter in the public's mind as the way the world will end. There's a lot of speculation, a lot of lurid B-grade movies about what a new infectious disease that would rapidly decimate the populations of industrial nations would be like. New diseases, as you well know, uh, arise and sometimes disappear uh, with biological, ecological, or social changes. And already in my lifetime, the eradication of smallpox, the um, advent of HIV AIDS. Medicine is in part a science that deals with biological realities, but what from the historian's perspective is interesting about uh, medicine is that those realities change over time. Morbid reality certainly changed in Europe in 1348 and during the same pandemic of plague in Asia, the Middle East, and Northern Africa. That year was the start of the 14th century pandemic of plague in Europe, the Black Death, my starting focus here. And as I want to suggest, that experience catalyzed lasting changes in the ways that Western societies react to new diseases, not all of them legacies we should feel comfortable about. And it's left us with images and metaphors that still powerfully inform the ways we think about and represent not just epidemics, uh, but contagious diseases more broadly. Although it's not certain, it's likely that this pandemic originated somewhere in Central Asia, where the wild, wild rodents of the steppes constituted a natural reservoir of infection. As most of you know, bubonic plague is primarily a disease of rodents. The uh, uh, term bubonic refers to the bubo, or enlargement of the lymph gland, that's a distinctive characteristic of the disease, which was represented at the time. Um, here, if you can see at the uh, saint's leg, uh, this was a patron saint uh, for the plague, uh, the angel sort of holding and pointing to the spot. Um, here, again, uh, this is the standard representation of uh, the patron saints pointing to the bubo, usually on the leg. The most common carrier is the rat, usually the black rat, here stuffed, and the plague bacilli, uh, Yersinia pestis, uh, are passed by rat uh, to rat by fleas. So in true bubonic plague, human beings will be infected only when fleas migrate from rodent to human or from human to human. The disease is not carried by the patient's breath or direct contact, not contagious from person to person, except by the way of the flea vector. Now, it's possible that in what happened in the 14th century pandemic <laughs> is that the disease started as bubonic plague, but that many of the deaths came from pneumonic plague, in which the disease becomes lodged in the lungs and doesn't have to invade the lymphatic system, usually doesn't have time to and can be transmitted directly person to person. But I guess what I want to stress here, and stress and jump up and down and really uh, emphasize, is 
I'll avoid the jumping up and down, but other than verbal, <laughs> is that none of this that we know now really matters to understanding medieval perceptions of contagion and perceptions of the danger posed by infected people or suspected people. Um, the danger that they were perceived to pose to other people. With plague or with Hansen's disease, set aside everything about etiology and epidemiology you know now. I mean, bring it back later, but just for the moment, put it in advance. From its original focus, the disease spread um, until by 1346 it had reached the shores of the Black Sea. From there, it was carried on shipboard to Constantinople, Geneva, and Venice. Within a few months, it had spread to Florence, Avignon, Valencia, and Barcelona. By summer, it was in Paris, by fall in England and Ireland, then Germany and the Netherlands. By 1350, all of Europe, from Russia to Scandinavia, to Italy and, and Spain, was dominated by plague. To give you a later anachronistic image, but to give you some feeling of what it was like, let me read part of a letter that was written during the next plague pandemic by a man in Naples. It's a long quote, but get a sense of what he's trying to capture. The town is now only recognizable by its edifices and magnificent houses, and no longer by its teeming population, the decrease in destruction of which is constantly augmented by the piled up corpses, of which 60,000 were burned, one part on Sunday morning and one part on Wednesday night. 170,000 have further been buried in huge trenches, the most aristocratic in the churches. The air is always so thick and misty and is further obscured by the multitudes of birds enticed by the carrion of the corpses, the stench of which is overwhelming. The dead are no longer counted. Misery and grief are great and general. Many die in despair, believing that hell can be no worse. Multitudes of dogs and cats scamper through the streets, appeasing their hunger on the corpses lying about everywhere. More than 300,000 people have died, of whom 60,000 have been burnt, and 20,000 have been thrown into the sea, as there was no one left to bury them. Now, the devastation of the plague in the 14th century is hard, at least for me, to imagine. Between a half, um, a quarter and a half, I've heard as much as three quarters of the population of Europe died, at least 24 million people. Whole villages disappeared. Um, England and France mutually agreed to give up on the war that they were fighting each other. With plague attacking both, they just couldn't keep up the battles. Venice and Genoa had been on the brink of war, but had to postpone it to 1351. I guess civilization needs to continue. In the Mediterranean and in the North Sea, crews on ships were entirely wiped out. Uh, so there were ships drifting around uh, completely unmanned. In southern France, mortality was great enough that the Pope consecrated the River Rhone at Avignon so that bodies flung into the river could be regarded to have received a Christian burial. So how do you react to that kind of situation? How does a society react? Especially if, as in 1348, you're confronted by a new disease, a stranger whose ways you don't know. Well, of course, the reaction takes place on a number of different planes simultaneously, psychological, economic, political, intellectual, spiritual. One impulse was to ask, who's to blame? And people sought culprits. The Black Death intensified the medieval tradition of the scapegoat Jew. <coughs> Jews were suspected of purposely spreading plague by contaminating wells or anointing houses with an imagined poison and were persecuted accordingly. I think the map is di difficult to read, but it charts out the areas of persecution over time. What especially sparked persecution throughout Europe in 1348 and 49 was a signed confession of a Jewish physician that he had intentionally been spreading the plague. Actually, the confession itself, the physical documents still exist. Uh, from our perspective, of course, it may not be entirely irrelevant that this physician made his confession only after a long period of being interrogated by authorities while on the rack. At Freiburg, all known Jews were herded into a large wooden building and burned to death. At Strasbourg, over 2,000 were hanged on a scaffold set up in a Jewish cemetery. 
and by one probably inflated contemporary account, um, over 16,000 Jews were killed in that city in Loam. In fact, the persecution got so bitter, got so out of hand, that the liberal pope, Clement VI, issued two papal bulls declaring the Jews to be innocent. But despite protests from the pope, hundreds of Jewish communities were completely destroyed. Other people thought that the plague had to be of a supernatural origin, of some kind of punishment inflicted by God, hence the supplications to the saints or to the Virgin Mary. At the same time, an urge to divert divine punishment emerged, most dramatically in organized mass flagellation. At first, the church welcomed this as a form of mass penance, but it too got out of hand. Late in 1349, the pope issued a bull against the flagellants. The group's activities were suppressed, and many of the flagellants were beheaded, hanged, or burned. Um, with, with logic that I say, it still escapes me, so if you get it, please explain to me later on. Um, a number of flagellants were actually condemned to be flogged by priests in front of the high altar of St. Peter's in Rome. There was, though, one important lasting development in medical thinking that the medieval experience with plague solidified, and that's the notion of contagion. Now, this notion was not entirely new. But ordinarily, epidemic disease was attributed to a particular condition of the atmosphere, uh, to the influence of a miasm. Um, it, it may well be familiar. You can think of a miasm as a uh, disease uh, conducive uh, effluvium arising from uh, rotting, uh, decaying animal or vegetable material, as from a swamp or as from a uh, diseased body. And, uh, uh, our term malaria, literally bad air, malaria, at first re referred not to any specific disease, but to this, this sense of a miasm. The notion of contagion in epidemic disease had first come into European consciousness through the experience, or at least the perception, of leprosy. So it was common in medieval thought before the time of the Black Death. Although leprosy had existed in Western Europe earlier, it may have been uh, first assumed extensive proportions as a result of the Crusades brought back by infected Crusaders <coughs> returning from uh, Jerusalem. Though I think it's important to note that lepers as a group, as they were seen and called at the time, surely included many individuals who were suffering from something other than what we would now see as Hansen's disease. During the 12th and 13th centuries, strict regulations were established to keep lepers from having contact with other people, not initially for medical reasons, but as a ritual expression of moral defilement. By the 13th and 14th centuries, though, lepers, and note I'm using the contemporary word here, Hansen's disease is a late 19th century category. Lepers had come to be seen as a danger to public health. And the idea behind their exclusion was in part to prevent the spread of a disease that was assumed to be contagious. When he, we talk about treating someone like a leper as an outcast, the expression is based on the ritualized exclusion from human contact set up during the High Middle Ages. Leprosaria, lazaretti, or isolation hospitals sometimes were constructed, though often lepers were left to survive by begging or by alms. Once a person was pronounced a leper, usually by a priest still, a priest might preside over a ceremony of exclusion or ritual death. The priest would bless a robe, a pair of gloves, and a noisemaker, uh, a clapper or a bell that the leper uh, had to wear or carry to warn off other people, and give these to the victim. He would then say, as one ceremony had it. I forbid you ever to enter into church, abbey, fair, mill, or market, or into the company of others. I forbid you to go out without your habit. I forbid you to wash your hands on anything about you, um, at the stream or fountain, or to drink there. I forbid you to touch anything you bargain for or buy until it is yours. I forbid you to go into any tavern 
If you go on the roads and meet another person who speaks to you, I forbid you to answer till you place yourself against the wind. I forbid you to touch children or to give them anything. I forbid you to drink or eat in company unless with other lepers. In one 12th century ceremony, once a person was identified as having leprosy, he or she would be required to put on a burial shroud and carry a small yellow wooden cross, uh, usually yellow, uh, the uh, color of the bell or the noisemaker in the image, um, the color traditionally used to mark dangerous, socially marginal people. Or a yellow cross would be sewn onto their garment. Then in the church, the priest would say a requiem mass, as for a dead person. They would proceed to the cemetery, and the leper would kneel while the priest administered holy water and threw earth over them three times. Um, it was a, a ritual death, a ritual exclusion of the contagious or assumed to be contagious person. Leprosy was regarded as, as exceptional, though, not a typical disease. The fear of contagion ritualized stigmatization isolation from the rest of society, all were exaggerated by intertwined religious, medical, and social responses to the victim. The Black Death, though, decisively established the idea of contagion, and in fact became the model of a contagious disease. Um, the plague doctor, as uh, you may well recognize the mask from Venetian Carnival, uh, uh, is a garb designed to protect the physician from uh, contagion or from the miasm. This part, the beak would, beak would usually uh, hold herbs or vinegar or some kind of aromatic um, um, substance to dispel the miasm or the contagion or um, both, since they were really uh, uh, often intertwined in thought. So what difference would this perception make? Um, if it's 1834, uh, 48, 1348, for example, and you live in Venice, what do you do? Well, one response is to flee. And it became almost a rule that when the plague came to a city, most of the wealthy would leave. The poor usually didn't have that option. Another was to see that people infected with the plague are isolated, separate them off just like you separate off lepers. And cities soon came up with measures to isolate the sick. Especially by the epidemics of the 15th century, lazaretti or isolation hospitals were set up for those diagnosed as having disease, or at least those diagnosed that way and who were poor. Setting up a quarantine against outsiders was another response. Venice was the first city to do this. Uh, being an island certainly helped. A council was set up in March of 1348, authorized to quarantine any ship it wanted on um, another island out in the Venetian lagoon. And other cities soon instituted some form of quarantine. The period of isolation at first 30 days gradually was extended to 40 days, uh, hence the term uh, quarantine derived from quarantinaria, a detention period of 40 days. There were lots of mystical associations for the number of 40, including a, a special significance in alchemy or the biblical flood of 40 days and 40 nights. The notion of contagion, in any event, informed the creation of quarantine. The people who witnessed the plague made one other <coughs> observation, though, that was crucial for intervention, which is that plague somehow seemed to be associated with filth. All classes of society were hit. Yet there was no doubt that in anyone's mind, the poor were more likely to get the plague than the affluent. Backing up that observation was the assumption that miasms contribute to um, disease. The logic here was filth causes disease, the poor live in crowdy, filthy conditions, and therefore they should be the ones most vulnerable to the plague. Causation that is now invoked both the idea of contagion and that of differential susceptibility. So if it seems clear that filth produces miasms and that miasms are conducive to plague, then filth becomes another focus of attention. 
What I would stress for our purposes this morning is that cleaning up the city often meant clearing away moral as well as physical filth and extended to immorality. The notion of dirt or pollution then as now had more than one meaning, more than one resonance. Legal sanctions against prostitutes, for example, were very common in plague years. They committed sins offensive to God, the reasoning went, and were a source of social disorder. And accordingly, they were one target of what we might regard as campaigns of moral sanitation, moral policing. In any event, it was out of the medieval experience with plague that the two standard forms of public health disease control in the West were developed, that is, quarantine and sanitation. And yet, I'm not at all sure that these are the only legacies our society has inherited from medieval Western attitudes toward contagious diseases. Um, patterns in Islamic countries, tellingly, were quite different, but I won't go into that now. The idea of contagion is very powerful. I pointed out how various groups were stigmatized as dangerous or as blameful. Prostitutes, Jews, foreigners, the poor. In fact, as a public health measure, late medieval authorities in northern Italy enacted legislation that would mark these people as dangerous in a way that everyone else could see. Significantly, they chose the color yellow, the traditional color used to identify socially marginal, dangerous groups. Lepers, as I mentioned, had been identified by a yellow cross or bell that warned away the healthy. Now, so that they could be known, often Jews were required by law to wear a yellow Star of David on their cap or on their shoulder. Prostitutes were labeled or marked with yellow. And in one instance in Venice, a male homosexual was dressed in yellow to witness the ritual public <coughs> execution of his lover. The concept of contagion provided a justification, not the necessity, but a justification for labeling socially marginal groups, those deemed undesirable or dangerous. And for the marginal, for minorities, for those deemed deviant, the suffering caused by infectious microorganisms could be no more severe um, than um, the suffering that came from society's expectations, prejudices, and fears. And I'm, I'm not a voter. Maybe those of you are, who are will recognize what a solid yellow uh, signal flying uh, sign represents, which is quarantine. Uh, it, it, it's persisted as a color to warn away from the danger of disease, the danger of contamination, of infection. Now, were there time, and there isn't, I'd look, like to look at other instances of stigmatization of the sick and how popular perception and public health action played out what we might regard as political, nativist, or racist agendas. This, from 19, the 19th century, depicts the invasion of Asiatic cholera, as it was known, with a clear, full-blown Orientalism. Bubonic plague in Cape Town, South Africa, around 1900, comes to mind in the, uh, that turn-of-the-century pandemic a case in which the public health solution was to set up concentration camps outside of the city and move all black Africans into these locations, as they were called at the time. White South Africans, sick or well, could remain at home. Or at the same time, when plague broke out both in San Francisco and in Sydney, Australia, opposite sides of the ocean, the Chinese were blamed, and the epidemic gave an occasion to act out pre-existing anti-Asian racism, expressed by strict measured against measures against each city's Chinatown, but not against European uh, American or European Australian uh, residents. What I'd like to do now, though, is cut abruptly to the decades just after the bacteriological revolution of the 19th century, just after Robert Koch, Koch's postulates, and Louis Pasteur. The 1870s through the 90s have been called the golden age, rightly, of bacteriology. 
with the identification of the bacterial causes of a long string of diseases, including um, Hansen's 1873 isolation of the microorganism associated with leprosy. It was during the first few decades of the 20th century that American fear of germs was set in place, sometimes caution, sometimes paranoia. And this was in large measure the result of an aggressive, at times sensationalist campaign in which public health workers and physicians set out to convert the public to what one historian has called the gospel of germs. Now, I could bombard you with uh, examples of both the messages and <coughs> media that were enlisted in this um, campaign of conversion to the gospel of uh, germs. Here, a streetcar in Milwaukee. This, a sandwich board on the back of a Texas pickup truck. Or elephants enlisted by public health workers from a passing circus. A subway sign. Children's health plays. They often presented vegetables on parade, but also germs and the battles. Parades like this in Brooklyn, or the modern health crusade, a children's crusade. This is from 1924. Uh, it was called a children's crusade at the time that enlisted close to a million young Americans in the fight against tuberculosis with a medievalism. Uh, this is a Mississippi campaign with the children in white attacking the black dragon. Um, with a medievalism shared by the Ku Klux Klan, refounded precisely during this era. But one point I'd like to make is that not surprisingly, but significantly, this campaign not only sensationalized danger, but also enlisted familiar ethnic, class, racial, and gender stereotypes, prejudices, and fear. We can read too much into any uh, one image. In fact, even in focus, I doubt if you can read anything in this, but at least you can get the image of the characters. Um, part of what's interesting to me about this 1923 cartoon from the AMA's health magazine, popular health magazine, Hygieia, is how absolutely typical it is. Uh, Jimmy Germ here uh, is depicted as a skinny, hook-nosed villain who strikingly resembles traditional characters of Jews, and characters at the time, the 1920s, of Southern European immigrants. He is a troublemaker, thwarted by a fair-haired child shown fresh from the tub, but finds a prime victim in a dark-haired, dirty child, shown sleeping with his window shut, ignoring the laws of health. At the same time, came campaigns against insect carriers of disease, fleas, lice, mosquitoes, flies, to take just the example of the fly, perhaps because it's the most foreign to our thinking now, the task was to transform something seen as pesky but innocuous into a dangerous killer, changing public perception and behavior, to remake the house fly or domestic fly into what was renamed the filth fly or typhoid fly. Here was the remaking of a germ carrier designed to tap into the kind of opprobrium long attached to leprosy, including the stereotype of the leper as filthy, rotten, nauseating, repulsive. The glass in the corner of the poster, yeah, I guess that is in focus. You can at least see the glass enlarging the fly. The glass doesn't just draw attention to the fly, but importantly, magnifies it. Public health films on the fly dwelled on just how disgusting the fly and its life habits are, capturing visually the opening caption here that, which I'll read to you, the house fly is born in filth, <coughs> lives in filth. This was the same aid as a 30-foot model fly constructed as part of a public health exhibit at New York's Museum of Natural History. Now, this campaign to stigmatize the fly as a dangerous disease carrier can seem quite risible, quaint, innocent, 
Uh, in, um, this is a film from the period. I, if you can't read it, it's uh, uh, adults and children on parade make every week clean up week and the, the campaign, which was a symbol, a uh, slogan of broader campaigns, SWAT the fly. Um, in Sinclair Lewis's 1924 novel, Aerosmith, for example, Almas Pickerbaugh, uh, Lewis's caricature of a health booster and head of a Midwestern city health department, publicized his cause, <laughs> innocent satire. Yet, this final frame from an anti-fly public health film, also made in exactly the same year, 1924, might, with hindsight, lead us to pause at the wider cluster of meanings that gave an image like this its cultural power. Made at the heyday of lynching in this country, and at the very height of immigration restriction campaigns, a film that closed with a lynched fly captioned exterminate the breed did more than newly stigmatize the housefly and bore rather broader messages about purity and danger. And what I'd like to do now is show you just one final example about how this, this gospel of germs was spread, was proselytized uh, here with a film clip. These, these mass crusades to inculcate the gospel of germs peaked in the 19 teens and 1920s, which means it coincided with um, the emergence of one new medium for public health education, which is to say motion pictures. Thomas Edison started making public health films in the 19 teens for the National Association for the Study and Prevention of Tuberculosis. But the clip that I would like to see you to see is from the 1924 U.S. Public Health Service film how disease is spread. Now, like others, in trying to convince the public about the danger of germs, the filmmakers confronted the problem. How do you make something invisible, that is germs, seem deadly dangerous? And how do you make familiar everyday objects and behaviors seem newly dangerous? Uh, quite literally, how do you stigmatize them as odious? This was the moment in American culture when the shared drinking cup, and often shared communion cup, paper money, even doorknobs, were reconfigured as potentially dangerous. Maybe your mother never told you these warnings, but I got them. This is the period in which it was forged. I'm using just a five minute film clip um, um, that is overtly about tuberculosis. Um, it's silence of, silent, of course, this is 1924, and you would have seen it with a piano player uh, capturing the drama and the melodrama of the film, but I thought I'd made enough audiovisual request and asking for the hospital to come up with the piano. Anyway. Uh, this I could hum along, but it's not going to help. <laughs> you know that over 30% of this number of deaths will be prevented? The remedy for this appalling condition lies in each of, the, of us knowing our disease is transmitted and doing his share to prevent the transmission. The traveler in this scene is suffering from tuberculosis. She will show you how disease carriers can sow the seeds of a dangerous malady. <laughs> Just coincidence. If the disease germs were visible, they would show whatever black stars appear in the following scenes. messages are pretty blatant. Uh, the black stars that make the invisible germs visible, the behaviors that spread those stars, which are to be banished from acceptable social behavior, uh, 
the words telling of you are all the diseases that can result from ignoring these health prescriptions or from associating with the kind of disease spreading people who do ignore them. There are other messages here too though. Uh, to a 1920s viewer, the new woman, independent, mobile, potentially dangerous, and here a disease spreader. The sexualization of disease transmission. Uh, we're told that she has tuberculosis, but the list of infectious diseases um, in that the first two given are syphilis and gonorrhea. The stars that keep appearing on the lips and so on. And the fact that on the map, over reading, I'll leave it to you, on the map showing the spread from a single carrier, the pointer goes straight to Ellis Island, reflecting and reinforcing perhaps links between immigrants and disease and a larger pattern of fear and prejudice about the immigrant menace. In the minds of many middle-class Americans, the association of poor immigrant and non-white citizens with infectious disease deepened the feelings of class prejudice, nativism, and racism that abounded early in the 20th century. It was a stigmatization of the dangerous other that linked together ethnicity, race, sexual preference to social danger, danger of contamination and infection in all senses. So I've tried here then to use historical perspective to offer one way to help us um, to better comprehend the powerful and remarkably durable links binding together disease and stigma in our societies. Some of our attitudes toward disease, disease threats, and infected people have a very old heritage indeed. Leprosy, like the early years of HIV AIDS, provides one of the starkest conjunctions of disease, fear, and stigmatization. In part though, what I've tried to suggest, taking just these two disparate moments from our past, is that some of the more lasting connections between disease and stigma they exemplify are not so much exceptional as they are infused into the fabric of Western society. And with that, I'll stop and thank you for being so very patient. Thank you very much. Uh, as I was hoping, I sort of felt like I was transported back to a college lecture. Uh,